Welcome to Health System CIO's interview with David Reese, Chief Information Officer at the University of Miami Health System. I'm Anthony Guerra, Founder and Editor-in-Chief. David, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, Anthony. All right, David, you want to tell me a little bit about your organization and your role? Sure. As the Chief Information Officer for the University of Miami Health System and the Miller School of Medicine, we're really focused on the full suite of digital tools to help our providers and uh, caregivers provide friction-free high-end specialty care to the patients that we serve. Uh, we have about 2,000 physicians mm -hmm. that work across the University of Miami Health System and the Miller School of Medicine. We're the only NCI-designated cancer center in South Florida. We have our primary hospital in the downtown Miami area and over 30 care locations across South Florida. Okay, very good. So the whole suite there of uh, everything a health system CIO would have under their purview. That's right. All right, so... One of the reasons I reached out to you uh, is a, your organization put out um, a release about a deal you, you've done with uh, Clear. Um, so I'm going to just uh, ask you to describe that. Um, I guess it'll be a two-part question, and you can take it however you want. Tell us what the deal involves. My interest was the security angle of it. Um, so tell us what the, the deal involves, and then the genesis of it, sort of. Uh, everything's got a genesis, right? There's a million things you could do, um, and we could get into governance, which is interesting and all that kind of stuff. But somehow, for some reason, this bubbled up, and there was enough of a need or a want to 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 get you moving on this particular initiative. So uh, those two questions combined. Perfect. So our, our deal with Clear is really focused on maximizing what they're best at, which is uh, matching identity. And what we see across our health systems in general, and, and certainly here at the University of Miami Health System, is ensuring that not only are identifying humans through digital means is a, is a really difficult thing to do as identity theft becomes more prevalent. And as evildoers across the globe try to impersonate users of systems. And so what we've done with Clear is take what they're best at, which is matching a picture with a known identity match and facilitating that identification process over the phone. So what we're endeavoring to do is use Clear and their tools connected with our tools so that when an employee were to make a phone call and request a service, the person they were getting the service from internally can use the Clear mechanism to validate that the person on the phone is who they say they are and that's mm -hmm. used. Um, proprietary technology that uh, Clear provides to us. So that's the first step of doing that with our staff. Our ultimate vision is to be able to create a frictionless way for patients to be able to use our patient portal and the sign-up process facilitated by Clear. So do you see this, um, and I'll bring it here now, you have an extensive background in security. You were a CISO at a health system previously. So I think that's that's very interesting. So did you see this approach as sort of unique in terms of the different things people are trying to do to bring security to their health system? Did you say, uh, this is really interesting and unique, and I think, I, you know, I like this? Yeah, we did. And I think what we use it kind of as a, we said, okay, and I'm a clear user at the airport. I know many use clear at various airports to, to speed up the time through the security line. Um, and, you know, when we heard clear had an interest in working in healthcare, the first thing we said was, well, how can we get the same benefit for our employees and our patients um, doing identity matching in the health system arena that we get when we speed through security lines in the airport. And that was really the genesis of it. Is, um, if, if we are trusting Clear's tools with the TSA to make sure that who's getting on the plane is who they say they are, um, then how can we bring that same level of friction reduction to the healthcare enterprise? So what does this take in terms of rollout and, and making it a reality? What, what's, the, what's the work involved? What are some of the challenges to get this done? It, it's, it depends on the environment that you're trying to do it in. And so our first focus has been internally on using clear to do identity matching for our staff when we are engaging in phone calls. So if the staff needs to call the IT help desk, for example, the help desk is now using clear to verify the caller is the caller they say they are. And that, you know, that took a couple of months worth of custom development work and workflow redesign, 
mainly around with our help desk ticketing system that and training of the agents to now use this this clear process so the clear part was the kind of the plug and play part what we had to change was the business processes that underpin plugging into clear Okay, uh, was that, and I hadn't thought about that, but was that a, a, a risk vector, sort of an attack vector? Were, were phishing calls uh, going into help desks or is that just a in convenient place to roll this out? It's a combination of both. I think we could see that it was going in that direction. Kind of when you read the media um, and you read the different security websites, you can pretty quickly discern that under very specific conditions, um, cyber criminals were targeting help desks and doing kind of direct impersonation. Uh -huh. And we wanted to make sure that we had a mechanism, a couple of mechanisms in place through multi-factor authentication um, and other kind of proprietary methods of caller identification. We wanted to augment those existing tools with another tool uh, in, a, in, in, in an attempt to both make the call more easy and at the same time, more secure. And it all revolves around identifying the caller as who they say they are. And again, this is a step one of rolling out clear. This is uh, almost like a pilot. Uh, you get this working and then what's the future vision? The future vision is to see, learn lessons by doing it internally and then see where we could take it, see where, where the, the technology makes the interaction easier. And so we're looking at different ways to do that on the patient side. Um, I think we have some ideas, but we want to see how the uh, the rollout for the internal use goes first. And where are you right now with this? Are you in the middle, beginning, in terms of just the help desk section? Yeah, it, we're at the we're at the the end of the beginning. The end of the beginning. <laughs> right. Okay. What would you um, say to other uh, CIOs and CISOs that are intrigued by this? Um, you know, make a call, check it out. Yeah, you know, definitely make, or, a call, make a call, <laughs> yeah. check it out. It is definitely worth investigating. Uh -huh. And they, the Clear team has been really great to work with. Okay. And let's talk a little bit more about how it sort of bubbled up to the actual to-do list. Yeah. Um, did it go through the governance process and things like that? Um, is this... I mean, does does something have to fall in a particular bucket? Like, does this fall in the security bucket? Does this fall in the patient engagement bucket? Yeah. Does it cover a lot of buckets? Yeah. I mean, this one, it, when we heard about Clear um, and their interest in healthcare, right? So we've all been Clear users for a while. When we heard about their interest in healthcare, um, it, it just, and I immediately checked a few boxes. It checked a, a user satisfaction box. It checks a potential patient experience box. It absolutely checks some security boxes. Um, it checks some regulatory and compliance boxes. And so when it, all those boxes checked pretty quickly, uh, the governance process was very simple to move forward with because okay. it just it checked so many right. so many boxes. Right. Okay. Very good. And um, it, and I will say too, uh, Anthony, that it, it really pushed more into our digital transformation focuses as well, because you know increasingly what we're trying to do is not do more of something. We're trying to do easier things that enhance security. So we're trying to both enhance our security and enhance our user experience at the same time. And clear, you know, through our all experiences in airports, has demonstrated excellence in that sphere of increasing security and reducing friction. And so what we've been pushing ourselves is to bring that same example to internal use first and then hopefully ultimately external use as well with our patients. Yeah, it's interesting you use the, the term we're trying not to do more. Um, I just this morning I was looking at one of the cybersecurity reports. You know, yeah. everybody's putting out a report now, which, yeah. <laughs> right? Lots yeah. of reports. Yeah. And one of them talked about how uh, it, there's almost a, a reverse correlation between the number of cybersecurity tools you have and sort of your security posture. The more tools, the less safe. Um, I read another report where uh, the individual said complexity is the enemy of security, right? So there's a lot there. There's a lot about, um, the, and there, that goes into application rationalization. The more apps you have, the less secure you are. Um, it, 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 are you thinking along those lines that I want to simplify my environment because that's going to help on the security front? It is. We want to have just as much complexity as required to be safe, but we certainly don't want layers and layers and tools and tools just for the sake of layers and layers and tools and tools. Right. 
Right. So we want to reduce complexity as much as possible. Right. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about that application rationalization. A lot of people are working on that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you're trying to balance sort of IT's desire to have the smallest suite possible with the user's desire to have the, the preferred tool that they want. You've got this small niche of very brilliant clinicians who say, I need this tool. It's the best one for what we do. How do you balance those discussions and debates? I mean, that, that one is really kind of simple. So our core tenant in the IT organization for the University of Miami Health System is to get to yes and be servant leaders. So in that regard, you know, the portfolio rationalization is an interesting topic for us in the sense that we certainly don't want multiple competing EMRs. And we're, as an organization, we've standardized on one leading electronic health record. But beyond that, we recognize that there are, are especially in subspecialty care like we have, there are specific tools for specific clinical and business and education opportunity needs that just aren't met elsewhere. So our portfolio is kind of broader than you might normally expect to see, but that's in keeping with our idea of get TS, have the right tool for the job and seamlessly integrate all of those. Right. And one of the challenges in this, in this area is when you get into these conversations, everybody is probably going to say, well, this is a tool I need. Yeah. Even if you go, well, we have three of these and they yeah. look the same to me. So mm -hmm. maybe yeah. we can reduce it. So it's, yeah. uh, there is a little more complexity and a little more nuance to it, right? I mean, and the question is, you know, to what are you given the mandate or do you want to reduce that portfolio? Because the more you want to reduce it, the more you will not push, but you will try and get that number down versus, yeah. hey, I just want everybody to be happy. So we're going to have a bunch of stuff. There's yeah. a balance there. So tell me your thoughts there. Yeah, there is. And I think the balance that we try to strike is not, uh, we're not managing to a number. We're not mm -hmm. managing to a target. We're managing to outcomes. And we offer choices. Mm -hmm. And it's those choices. It's those choices and those managing to outcomes that frankly make the get to a decision pretty straightforward and relatively simple. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I find is when we find people who have the best interest of the organization at heart, we focus on what's best for the patient. We talk about choices and options. The choices and options become really clear very, quick, very quickly. Mm -hmm. and in some cases, that means we're going to expand the portfolio. In other cases, it means we're going to take a tool from the portfolio that we have and, and use it in a novel way. Yeah, and, and IT is not going to make that decision. Well, right. uh, again, tell me how this is working because IT wants to reduce we want to just have the number we need so what is it's role in in sort of driving those conversations because i guess at the very least you want a conversation and you want people to think that if we can get rid of one of these there are, there's positive uh results of that to the enterprise right yeah. so guys we have five they look similar to me if we can reduce it good things happen to the enterprise now if you say we can't we can't Tell me more about those discussions. Yeah, the discussions, and I think what we've what we've settled on so far is the portfolio is what the portfolio is. What we're really focusing on is being purposeful in how we add new tools to the portfolio. Okay. And so the first thing that comes up when someone wants to introduce a new tool is we say, great, that's that tool. Is it a best-in-class tool? Is it in the Gardner Magic Quadrant? Do we already have that tool in use somewhere else, or do we have a, a peer tool that's ranked higher? So that first quality, that quantitative review very quickly um, brings a certain level of discussion to the choice. And then from there, it's if we find that yes, it's additive to the portfolio, but meets an unmet need, then we just do it. We just that's how we get to yes. If we find that there's tools that we already have that look similar, we will schedule demos with the with the, with the part of the organization that wants to bring in that tool and then say, you know, here's the tools that we currently have, here's the functions that they can bring form, how does that compare with the demos or ideas that you have about this new tool? And if they're, if the existing tools can meet the need, we just move forward with the existing tools. And we haven't had to get into this whole yes, no, vote, raise your hand, where's the funding coming from? When we take the approach that we have, which is choices, options, what's best for the patient and what's best for the provider, we find that the choices make themselves nine times out of 10. That's excellent. So you definitely have a, a, a sort of a two buckets in your mind and completely different approaches for existing portfolio. 
and new stuff. The new stuff's getting a pretty good look. Yeah. Existing portfolio, we're not so much going back and trying to beat that number down. That's right. We're not relitigating the decisions of the past, <laughs> making good decisions for the future. Well, you know, it's interesting. So let's talk about relit relitigating the decisions yeah. of the past. Um, and let's talk about third party security review. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, everyone's got a completely new lens through which they're looking at new applications that would come into the organization. They're getting a much stronger security look, right? They it maybe didn't used to be that strong, but now with third party breaches and all, it's a huge area of risk, mm -hmm. getting a much different look. I know individuals who are working on that. Um, but they've also been tasked to relitigate the past for every application they have. It's a huge, huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like your thoughts around specifically now around the security implications of both existing tools that let's say we've upped the bar now, right? So we have existing tools that were not held up to that new higher bar. They were held up to the old bar. And we've got new stuff that's being evaluated, which we can fairly easily hold up to the new bar. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts there? And how are you handling that? Yeah. Like I think everyone in the industry and across industries in the US, we now we do have to think, you know, as we look at the portfolio that we have, the safety and soundness of that portfolio. And we have, I think, done a great job over the last couple of years of categorizing the scale inside the existing technology portfolio and focused intently on what's frankly run in-house, what's run in the cloud, going back and making sure we have great third-party reviews of the items that are running in the cloud. And then with a specific purpose, re-examining the security around the existing tools. And we have on more than one occasion said this tool that's running in-house today is no longer, it doesn't meet the safe and soundly safety and soundness standards of today. And we need to move off of it and you know and sunset it. And we've done that more than a handful of times in the last couple of years and presented that way. But you have to provide choices, right? We're going to sunset this one because it needs to be upgraded or we're going to sunset this one because um, we have a better, more more future proof option than what exists today. Um, what we haven't done is kind of use the draconian security says you have to turn this off approach. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the cloud. Um, when it comes to security, and I, I like my bucket I, concepts because it works with my brain. Yeah. Um, do you see two buckets, cloud, non-cloud? No, a different level of treatment from a security point of view. Tell me about that. It's not levels of treatment being different. It's the types of treatment. So we, we, the same level of security and security posture exists both on-premise for on-premise solutions as well as for in the cloud solutions. But the way we go about meeting that level of security, which is the same for on-premise and, and cloud, the level is the same, but the way we get to that level is obviously very different. Um, and I think what we find now more and more is the cloud tools had been the flavor du jour for many years. They were perceived to be safer. They were perceived mm. to be more secure. Um, they were certainly being pushed more aggressively by uh, our vendors and partners. And I would say over the last maybe nine, 12 months, as we think about cloud, cloud security, cloud stability, we're seeing that there's not more security in the cloud necessarily, just because it's in the cloud and in some cases, the complexity of cloud-based applications makes them even perhaps even less secure. And so what we are looking at now really is the layers of technology it takes to deliver a cloud application. And in some cases, we've begun to really say, you know, that's a tool that might actually be better served in a hosted data center. That's not necessarily a cloud-based data center or in a on-premise data center, not necessarily just a cloud-based opportunity. So I think we're we're more cautious in the way we engage cloud-based vendors at this point than we had been, I think, in the last you know few years. That's fascinating. And it's not the first time I've heard that. Um, it's almost like, it, it is, as you mentioned, the pressure, it's almost like this huge wave that, that swept everybody into the cloud. And now there's some of that wave coming back as people are saying, well, you know, there are some issues here and, and 
maybe having having a little bit of a everybody used to say oh, i don't want to be in the data center business i don't want to be that was the cool thing to say you had yeah. to say it as it's you had to say i don't want any part of a data center not yeah. so much anymore. There's yeah. a little different tone out there, correct? There is. I mean, it is, you know, what's core to the mission always, what's core to the mission evolves over time, right? And for years, it had been running data centers might not be core to the mission of a healthcare enterprise, or running data centers might, might not be core to the mission of a, of a higher education institution. And now you sit there and go, probably not at scale core to the mission, but maybe in particular use cases, it's better to have a controlled tool on premise that we are very crystal clear on how access is provisioned to, rather than a cloud-based tool, which gets more and more opaque over time in terms of how access is provisioned for it, how security is wrapped around it, what vendors are supporting it in the different layers that exist within the cloud. So I think we've we've begun to understand, I think, you know, from an investment, if you compare cloud security today to investment mindsets in the mid 2000s, you know, it's kind of like you got to understand the investment and understand the risk that you're signing up for when you make the investment. I think it's the same thing now in cloud. You really have to understand the cloud tool and all its layers to understand the risk that you're signing up for. It's really interesting. We're doing a, a webinar uh, in a month or, or so on this idea of cloud security. Yeah. And one of, you know, as I, I just, you know, work out the topic, um, it came to my attention. I was told, you know, there's there's could be hundreds of security controls, buttons, and switches, so to speak, that have to be all set correctly to have security right in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So it's not simple. Mm -hmm. So part of it may be, you know, do I have the team? Do I have the team to do this? Um, do I not have the team to do this? If I don't have the team to to put me in the cloud securely, I don't want to be doing it, it sounds like. Right. I mean, I think it's a view is by build or partner, right? So um, I think when you talk about the cloud, you kind of have to think in that build by partner mindset as well, which is if you're going to the cloud and you don't have a team that's well versed in delivering solutions in the clouds robustly, but by right robustly, I mean securely and reliably, mm -hmm. then you have to think about the, the partner, you have to think about the partner or by. Uh, models as well. You can't just go and build in the cloud what you build on premise. So this is um, really interesting. It was a great conversation, really interesting stuff. Um, we know that we have to have secure, I mean, we have to have security built in from the beginning. Everything we do cannot be a bolt on, cannot be an afterthought, right? And this is, I'm guessing, and I'm sure this is different for you. They're, they're what I would call security minded CIOs. I think every CIO is security minded, but there are some that it's sort of in their DNA based on how they came up. You might have a CIO who's an MD. Now they're going to be really good at the clinical stuff and they might not need a CMIO um, because they're good at that stuff, but they might not be as secure, strong in security as someone like yourself. So for you, it's probably a no brainer to build it in. I wonder if it isn't for everybody, but it seems like it has to be. I mean, and I was thinking before we got on the phone, I was thinking the analogy of airports, right? Mm -hmm. You don't design and build an airport and then have the safety guys come in and say, hey, guys, you know, add the safety stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I'm thinking about security now with IT, yeah. right? Yeah, because it is it is 100%. Security, it's reputation risk. Um, it is it's it is important and it is vital. And it always has been. I just think it's it's coming to the forefront now that security is concerted from the front because that way we can help security be a yes organization rather than a no organization. Um, that's really, I think, my intent here as we think about how to manage risk across the technology portfolio is involve the security experts early, put them in a position to say yes and here's how rather than these binary, yes, this is secure, no, this is insecure, um, which is kind of what traditionally the security departments have been put in the position of it's like at the end they're like hey is this okay and they have to do like this quick yes no you know we put that in all the way up front and say let's do this from let's do security and risk management from the start that way there is no 11th hour check that creates a lot of unnecessary anxiety because we've done security risk management all along the way and do we think that 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 11th hour paradigm um 
That was the case because security used to be seen as an impediment to doing business. The old style CISO was a, you know, hell no, we're not doing that, brought everything to a screeching halt. So it was almost like, let's wait until the last minute so they don't have a choice. It's like a fair complete, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that's how it used to be. But now, you know, every security professional worth their salt, it talks like you talk about enabling the business. Yes, yeah. uh, yes, if, or yes, here's how, yeah. not just no. So I don't know, it's a change in paradigm, right? It is, and it is. And I think what, you know, which one's the cart and which one's the horse, I don't know. But what I do know is the following. Uh, when we used to talk about security, it was always through the lens of compliance. We had to do security because it was a compliance requirement. At some point, the conversation has shifted from just because you're compliant doesn't mean you're secure, but if you're secure, you are definitely compliant. And we flipped, I think the paradigm that you're referencing that we flipped is we stopped thinking about security as a compliance matter. And we started thinking about it as, an, as a systemic risk matter. And that way, we weren't just trying to check a compliance box. We were trying to produce a scalable and sustainable solution over time. So your CISO's name is Mauricio Angie? Yep, Dr. Mauricio Angie. Okay, okay. So that's interesting. As a former CISO, you're hiring a CISO. Did you hire Mauricio? Was he I did, one? Yeah. Okay. I did. So as a former CISO, what were you looking for in a CISO who was going to report up to you? Yeah, well, so someone that had a, a yes and here's how mindset. So you referenced earlier that that the kind of the old paradigm mindset. So certainly wasn't looking for that. Was looking for someone that really was a business enabler, a clinical enabler, an educator enabler, or a researcher enabler, um, and was more interested in how to get to a safe, secure, and sustainable solution rather than just flexing the power of yes and no. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, um, what, how, and your description of uh, a good relationship, a good CIO CISO relationship, how do you think it should ideally work? Constant dialogue, conversation. And I think, in many respects, kind of authentic discussions. So, that's one of the, the CIO CISO relationship is one that's got to be rooted in a common understanding. And I think most importantly, just an authentic professional relationship where the anxieties can be talked about, the fears can be talked about, real thought partnership can happen. And through like a whole brain thought, we get to a robust response rather than a transactional or just a status report update. It, it's really got to be a, a, a partnership because it's those two relationships that are managing large portions of the systemic risks that are presented to the enterprise phenomenal amount right yeah, when you think yeah. of those two roles yeah when you think about the budget that those two there, there, there's right. big budget there that's being controlled by those individuals that's huge right. risk to that's the right. organization if those two aren't in sync and that's working right. well together right right very good stuff um top security trends that that you're looking at um things that uh, you want to prepare your organization to deal with maybe technologies you're looking at or, or, uh, you know, in addition to the clear stuff yeah. we talked about. Yeah. So I think identity management continues to be one area, of just that's necessary focus and need. Um, especially when you think about our organization, which has students, researchers, patients, faculty, and staff, the, the range of identities that we're managing is pretty broad and they have, you know, a, a very long lifespan. So continuing to, come up with the most robust and simple to use identity management matching is, is really key for us. Another one is not only being a, a major player in research space and education space and, and the healthcare space, what we find is we move a lot of data as well. And so I think one of the things that has captured a lot of media attention over the last year, year and a half is um, web-based tools that are used to kind of move data around. And so making sure that those tools are well understood and well secured is an area of continual focus. I think not only for us, but you know, kind of the whole technology industry as a whole. Um, and then beyond that, right, it's really continuing to make sure that we are we are equipping the teams 
with the skill sets they need to be successful today. From a security standpoint, I think we have to kind of bake in a common level of understanding of security across all the IT teams that exist within the enterprise, right? Security is not just security's problem. Um, security is an area that everyone has to kind of be mindful of. Some people pay all of their attention to it. Some people have to concentrate on other areas and be mindful of security. So I think raising the level of awareness and education across the IT enterprise about security and what security means is, is another key area of focus for us. Any, uh, what's your, do you do much work with marketing? Because when we want to, you know, right, because with the clear stuff, you put out yeah. a press release. So, yeah. um, and there's probably, you know, from a security point of view, when we want a savvy uh, workforce, uh, we want to get the word out there about, you know, different things to watch out for. You had phishing yeah. exercises, um, you know, don't click on this and that. Uh, you're also leveraging marketing to get the word out on, in those areas? We are. Yeah, we, I mean, we have great partnerships with our, our marketing communications team. And so we rely on them quite heavily. And that, I think, is kind of one of the areas that I focus the most on, which is carrying the message across the enterprise uh, and making sure that the messages we produce, and we do a great job of this, uh, produce concise, tight messages that deliver a clear, that deliver a clear action um, and that are seen in a way that helps us keep the organization safe, but at the same time, make things easier. So I'm all about enhancing security and, and reducing friction. Yeah, I had an interesting conversation the other day um, about that idea of having a savvy workforce, uh, about the importance of reporting things quickly. So if you've clicked on something and your computer starts to get screwy, uh, don't close it and go to lunch. And yeah. Like I said, that would be my instinct. I'd be scared to death. I'd panic, close yeah. the computer, go to lunch. Bad, really bad, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have to create a culture and and the individual is saying you want to go beyond that you want to create a culture where it's almost a reward for reporting that you did something like that so yeah. not only you're not going to get in trouble for it but you're actually going to get accolades for having reported that you accidentally clicked on something because time is everything with uh mitigating the um the effects of, of whatever's going to happen so your yeah. thoughts on that yeah i couldn't agree more like the punitive culture is it's just it, it is utterly and totally unhelpful um so celebrating kind of celebrating a security mindset and i would say you i would say you know users clicking on things or or think that technology executing on a computer on a person's computer they're not things that they did they're things that were done to them mm. right? they were victims of crime they were not doing something untoward and so i think kind of repositioning of you know fact that you didn't do something wrong per se it's that something on some security event happened to you so help us know that that happens so we can a protect your data and uh, help us all recover from it and so kind of getting to a, a place where people see that this is some a reportable event not from the standpoint that they did something wrong but some from the standpoint of it's a crime like they were the victim of something all right david final That's question cool. um yeah. Your, this is my typical final question. Your best piece of advice for someone in your position at a comparable sized health system, based on your experience in your career, what's your best piece of advice for that individual? My best piece of advice would really be focus on how we can enable patients to get access to care better, how we can make it that easier, how we can help keep the user satisfaction up, and in particular, focus on physician satisfaction and be relentless in helping the organization get to yes. Excellent. Excellent, David. I want to thank you so much for your time today. I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this. Thank you, Anthony. It was a great, great day. I appreciate it. <laughs>